Okay, this week we're talking about integrated pest management or plant health care. So IPM takes a holistic approach. It emphasizes plant health. It takes an ecosystem approach. And it emphasizes working with nature rather than against it. It's integrated because it uses a mixture of science-based methods to protect plants or sites from pests. And what I mean by that is there's not going to be one method that is going to manage your pest, most likely. You're going to have to use a combination of things. And you want to use science-based information. There's a lot of home remedies out there that actually can cause more problems. A pest is considered an insects, mites, pathogens, weeds, animals, um, anything that becomes a nuisance. And management would be a planned systematic way to control pest populations for damage below a predetermined level. And keeping in mind that most pests are going to be very challenging to actually control completely. You're just going to be able to manage them. So in IPM you need to have a knowledge of the biology of the pest that you're dealing with. You also need to know about ecological interactions with the hosts, the natural enemies and competitors. And how does the weather and condition at the site affect the pests? Well, beneficial organisms, they may not be present. It may be too cold. Your neighbor may be using too much in the way of pesticides and killing off beneficial organisms. So um, you need to look at all of these things. And you do want to establish an economic or aesthetic threshold. So preferred management techniques encourage naturally occurring biological controls. You use alternative plant species or varieties that resist pests. And you select pesticides with lower toxicities. You want to adopt cultivation, pruning, fertilization, and irrigation practices that reduce pest problems, not create them. You also want to create the habitat that makes it inc incompatible with pest development. And we'll talk about what that is. So you have key pests, occasional pests, and secondary pests. So a key pest is something that needs to be managed or economic loss occurs. In the Pacific Northwest, two of these are appling, coddling, apple coddling moth and apple maggot. They usually have two generations. The culling moth has two generations per year and sometimes even three. Here's an example of an occasional pest. This is maple twig borer, also known as maple shoot moth. This is an occasional pest in nursery production in Pacific Northwest. and green peach aphid, which I'm sure most of you have dealt with at one time or another. These can be managed with natural enemies, so it's important that you don't break out the pesticides right away. So first you need to know what you're dealing with and determine a population, the, if the population is such that control is necessary and you use monitoring to do this. You determine what the plan is for action, preventing pests in the first place, and utilizing biological control, cultural control, mechanical control, and in some cases, chemical controls. So here are a couple of stink bugs, and I'm sure you've heard of brown, brown marmorated stink bug. This is actually uh, an invasive species in our area. The brown marmorated stink bug has made it to Oregon and feeds on tree fruit crops as well as vegetables and small fruit. And the rough stink bug is actually a predator of caterpillars, beetle larvae, and adults. So it's really important that you correctly identify what insect or pest you have to be able to manage them. So when you're monitoring, you want to look at daily or seasonal conditions, what pests may be liable to show up given the crop you're growing, what the weather has been like, if it's been incredibly dry or incredibly wet, what kind of soil you have, uh, what is the plant health to begin with, because healthy plants can usually outcompete some of these things, 
and you want to look at presence of pests and beneficial insects and in this case we have a pheromone trap for coddling moth. So an economic threshold is population level which serious damage or crop losses occur. This is really important in urban uh, agriculture or agriculture in general, in greenhouse and nursery. Um, aesthetic threshold is the damage level unacceptable to the viewer even if the plant health may not be at risk. And this is usually a homeowner that um, doesn't understand that uh, plants are not static and they may show some damage while they're not even in danger of dying. So you want to definitely know your pests. This is a spruce aphid and timing is really key here. And unfortunately, given the, the life cycle of this pest, biological controls are rarely able to be used. Um, they're very small uh, green aphids that cause needle drop. They appear early in the season, about February, may increase rapidly during March and April. So it's really important that you control it early if you're um, interested in maintaining the health of your spruces. It is uh, important to know that with Colorado blue spruce, if you use oils, which sometimes is recommended, it will actually um, cause the blue to go away on your plants. But that's better than not having any needles. And here's just a list out of your book about ways to prevent pest problems in the landscape. Of course, right plant, right place. Make sure you know what kind of soil you're dealing with, using resistant cultivars, using correct irrigation, um, doing the right cultural activities to discourage pest development at the right time. Um, just keeping plants healthy, etc. So there's resistance versus tolerance. Resistance, uh, plants have some sort of property that prevent or impede disease development. Tolerance is when the host develops and continues to grow and produces well despite the pathogen's pa presence. So host resistance, well, of course, rose black spot is a way of life in the Pacific Northwest, but Helmut Schmidt is resistant to this disease. Red steel of strawberries is a phytophthora disease. Plants will eventually wilt and die, but charm, firecracker, and tillamook are actually tolerant of this disease, which is really important because Phytophthora can just be devastating and it doesn't go away. It stays in the soil for several years. So the tools you use for integrated pest management are biological controls, cultural controls, mechanical or physical controls, and chemical controls. So biological controls include parasitoids, predators, nematodes, pathogens. In this case, we have a wasp that parasitizes aphids. And uh, very, there's several wasps that do these things. Um, there's also um, true bugs and beetles that feed on insects. And there are beneficial nematodes that you can apply to soil to deal with things like crane fly larvae. Cultural controls include modification of landscape management uh, practices, including correct irrigation, air movement, etc. This is a backyard that um, used to be behind, I used to have. And as you can see, things are incredibly crowded, and you can imagine uh, there's a lot of powdery mildew out there. There's also some problems with aphids, etc. So just thinning things out would do wonders to help with that. Mechanical controls can include things like pruning out damage. And this, in this case, we've got a picture of canker disease. You want to prune it out at least six inches behind the damage. It's important to look up particular controls for each disease because each one is different. But in this case, it's six inches behind.
So when you're using chemical controls, you want to use things that are not broad spectrum where they kill everything, including beneficial insects. You want to time things correctly if you're going to go ahead and use chemical controls. You want to make sure you're using it at the right time to get the best control. Using the right modes of action, look at cost benefit analysis to see, you know, is this pest, pesticide going to help you uh, save the life of the plant and looking at what kind of environmental risks you're talking about. The thing to remember is that insects and diseases develop resistance and you quite often will have a pest resurgence after that and then you'll have a secondary pest outbreak. So uh, one example of that would be in Central Park um, several years ago they had Asian longhorn beetle so they treated for the longhorn beetle and the this was elm trees which are already in danger because of Dutch elm disease. Um, they actually became very infested with mites after they treated them for the Asian longhorn beetle. And of course, thinking about pollinators. So neonicotinoid pesticides or neonics are chemically related to nicotine. They act on certain kinds of receptors in the nerve synapse. They're more toxic to invertebrates than mammals. They were originally thought to be safe for pollinators and beneficial insects. And while the EPA has not banned it, several municipalities have, and the city of Seattle in particular has banned all neonics. It's very toxic to bees. So this is uh, metacloprid, which is one of the, probably the most used pesticide out there and uh, this is year, use of by year and crop um, and you can see it's just grown ex exponentially the use of uh, pesticides and uh, in imidacloprid in particular. And here's a study that was done it shows the drastic influence of imidacloprid um, that had on honey production in France after it was introduced in 1998. You can see the production went way down. And it's just really important that you don't use these products and try to um, use nurseries that don't sell these products because without bees 70 percent of plants would be unable to produce, reproduce or provide food one of every three bites of food we eat is uh, from a crop pollinated by honeybees. And of the 100 crop varieties that provide 90% of the world's food, 71% are pollinated by bees. So really important that you think twice about using some of these pesticides. Aminocloprid is used a lot because it works. It's a systemic pesticide and um, a lot of Farmers and landscapers have had a lot of success with it, but it's really not worth it. 